Welcome to the Sunday sermon portion of our worship service for January 24th, 2021, for God's house. Let us pray as we prepare our hearts and minds to share in reflecting on the word of God that we have heard Jackie share with us in her music at this time. God, we ask that your presence, your word would come to us. We ask that our hearts might listen, that your spirit might help us to understand. We ask now that your spirit would also guide us in our reflecting on the scriptures that have been read for today. That Our thoughts, our deeds, our hearts and minds might reflect your love and be centered on you. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Savior. Amen. The time is up, Jonah says. Sometimes I wonder why this text isn't in Advent instead of now, here in Epiphany. But they are the same. The time is up. It is a time to repent. It is a time for God's will and purposes to be revealed. But you know the games we humans play. Hide and seek charades, timed games of chess or checkers, or the silent auctions. Somebody says time is up and all the sheets are taken up and everything's said and done. There's game show buzzers going off for the end of turns. Then we play games also with a due date for our bills sometimes, or quitting that harmful habit that we keep thinking about needing to do and get rid of. Like the days of young Samuel in last week's sermon, there comes a time when God says, it is enough. And we also recognize this phrase in a different use from Jesus' lips on the cross, that God's path for reconciliation is fulfilled. There's a limit to human sinfulness that God has set. When the time is up, when it's a time for a God-initiated change, People know they had better look up and respond. But this analogy has its pitfalls. Saying the game is over and it's time to ante up can fall into a sort of judgmental finality for our life choices because these choices do have lasting effects. Jonah, in preaching to the Ninevites, offers us a corrective message. This excerpted text from the book of Jonah is read apart from the whole story in this reading today, and it really needs its whole context for us to make sense of it for the times we live in today. So let's look at briefly this story in its entirety. In chapters 1 and 2, Jonah is called to carry a message to the Ninevites, but he goes the other way and gets into all sorts of trouble, and there were dire consequences for his choice. But Jonah is given a second chance. Then there's this passage in chapter 3, today's reading, where Jonah finally concedes and goes and preaches a message of the coming judgment to the Ninevites. And from the king down to the livestock, there is deep repentance and hope for God's mercy, a belief that God's love and compassion might cause God to relent from the destruction that was planned. When nothing bad happens, Jonah's not satisfied with the outcome. He goes off to a nearby hill to watch and see what God will do. Still nothing happens, and Jonah is angry with God. These Ninevites are such evil people. They're enemies of God's chosen ones. And Jonah has more compassion for his withered shade plant than for any of them. So God shows up at the pity party. <laughs> And calls Jonah's time too. It's time for the people of Israel, God's so-called chosen people, to stop looking at all other people as enemies, as a people who are loved, unloved by God. What with all that's been going on in our nation the past few weeks, perhaps it's time for how we also look at how we look at others not like us, if we are going to call ourselves Christian. Perhaps it's nearly past time for such a reality check for our national social life and political life. Perhaps the compassionless anticipation of God's wrath on those not like us is due for a word of God's grace. Perhaps the time is up for us now. Not all of the, all of the thems that we think are unworthy, 
but us, our attitudes of self-righteousness, privilege, and entitlement. Then there's a story of Jesus showing up in Galilee after John's arrest. The time was up for the old Jewish system of sacrifices and minute laws of ritual cleanliness. It was time for all that God had intended for that faith to point toward, to be fulfilled. It's time to call out a new people and a new life. A time to call a people from all nations into God's love. But God would begin with Israel's people, but they would not be the only ones. Last week we heard how Samuel mistook God's voice for Eli's. In this case, religious leaders refused to hear God's words from John and manipulated his arrest. They refused to recognize the prophetic voice of the herald who was coming before the Lord. No matter, the story will go on. And the time is up for the mistakes. The real thing is here now, and it's Jesus. Our responses matter. Today we have religious people who claim that the previous president is God's chosen one. We have religious leaders who've been in his allies in power. We have those who claim that violence and racism are the path to social peace, purity, and stability. But as Tim put it well last week, who are we really listening to? I ran across a Facebook comment this past week. The person who wrote it said, I really need to check whose symbols are are on the people or with the people in the crowds that I'm marching with. Because if I'm with the wrong crowd, I need to get out of it. The time is up for making our decisions about who we are following and what we believe. Jesus has begun calling his disciples out to follow him and to learn his ways of love and compassion, to speak truth and to do justice, to walk humbly with God and one another, and to become citizens of the heavenly realm of God to show love in the beloved community of humanity that Dr. Martin Luther King saw coming. This all ties together with what's happening now in our country. The time is up for deciding where we stand personally and as faith communities who claim the name of Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians that the time is short, he was in essence saying the time is up. We have short human lifespans and it's time for us to acknowledge and to be the change that we need, want to see. Paul sees the doomed day signs of his day being just like the ones of Nineveh or so Sodom. And is that what we have come precipitously close to today here in our country? When the time is short, there is no room for fiddling around about our commitments, hedging our words, and not examining our ways for consistency with Jesus. It's hard for us to imagine doing what Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John did, just dropping their nets and leaving their vocations to follow Jesus as, as his disciples. It feels strangely abrupt without context or prior knowledge. But you know, we really don't have the rest of the story for each of them. What we do have is this story about the moment when their fisherman time was done. And we also have such a time of point of change in our own lives. We call it conversion or commitment to a new way of life. It is a real turning in our baptisms, our profession of faith, that turns our lives upside down and in a new direction. There are other stories in scriptures about time being up too. There's the prodigal who finally comes home and his unforgiving brother, who's another Jonah type, wants his father to bring down judgment, not mercy and forgiveness. He wants to have privilege. There's Paul, a persecutor of the church who's converted on the road to Damascus, returning to Jerusalem, and the disciples, the apostles there, are terrified of him. Barnabas seems to be the only one who trusted the power of the Spirit to change people. We have people in our own lives that have, we have harmed. It matters not what others may think of us. If we have truly repented and turned in faith to Jesus, God's mercy and forgiveness is enough. But others need to have us change for us to be healthy in community. The prayer Jesus taught us to say includes this humility and grace. Forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we have forgiven others. It's a mutual thing. Yes, 
God's coming will disrupt the systems in our lives. And we need this disruption in our fear and enemy-based thinking that have divided our nation and the world. Humanity is self-destructing in its binary competitions for power, resources, and pursuits of pleasures. The time is up for unsustainable ways because the consequences are coming upon us quickly in uncivil wars, ecologic collapse, and addictions. The old order needs to be disrupted. Today, as our nation readjusts its course in history under new leaders, the dust of the chaos of the past five years is still swirling around us. It will take a true conversion for our civil life to be healed. It will take grace and forgiveness to lower the defensive walls we have constructed in our political and social lives. It will take humility to be mutual and reconciling with one another so a more just communal life can be created among us. It will take an intentional commitment to begin a new way of life without social discriminations such as racism and sexism. We will have to tell the truth to one another in this process. The first person we'll have to tell the truth to is ourselves because the first lie is the one we told ourselves. We will have to face our fears. That's why we told the lies. We will have to hear the truths that others speak. We will have to let go of our justifications and the strategy that the best defense is a good offense that continues to pit us against one another with violence. Sometimes I think that we are acting like children squabbling and wrecking the house and this earth until our parent walks in the door and we know the time is up. We act like Adam and Eve then. The devil maybe we do what we say, or we claim that someone else is to blame. Well, the time is up anyway, and it's time for this nation to deal with its historic traumas that have created our, our present domestic crisis. January 6th, we came precipitously close to our political collapse. If we in the church are the Jonas called to go and preach to Nineveh, to the United States, and to the world, let us not go with hate and revenge in our hearts. If we as a nation have been like the Ninevites, let us recognize our spiritual condition and need for grace. Let us repent in humility and become Jesus' disciples, not just in words and shallow things, but in genuineness of heart and in our deeds. Perhaps God will relent and forgive and heal us and our land. The disciples who were called out in our text from Mark were cleaning and mending their nets. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. People is the actual word in the Greek. The physical cleaning and mending of the web of our relationships in, the, in this country is a noble and difficult task, but we have a greater and deeper task for our spiritual healing, for confronting the misjudgments and lies, for healing the paralysis of fear, hate, and discriminations, and for calling people to commit to discipleship in the love of God for all people. This is the message of Jonah. The time is up for our old ways. We must repent. Let us hear the good news then today while we can. The God we have come to know in Jesus Christ is just and merciful. Let us repent and turn in faith and by the power of the Spirit to live together in God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. And then there will be hope for the future. In God's name, amen.